Now, I've been asked several times to write my definitions down, so I'll do that so you can see them. The first word was cathode ray. What did you have, Marnie? Um, the glass tube is near That's a cathode ray tube. So what would a cathode ray be? Stream of electrons it doesn't have to be in a vacuum. I've just added to it because of the class. It doesn't have to be near vacuum. As you saw, uh, the first tube was at 30 millimetres mercury. You can in fact go high, um, lower vacuums and that still had to work. The next one was, I forget, striation. It's not only, okay, you have to be careful here. Some of these terms don't just apply to cathode rays. You've only seen them as cathode rays. So it's light and dark bands. And you can put, if you want, in a, in a medium. Yeah, all sorts of stuff. But as long as it's light and dark bands, this is striation. Okay, and then we have cathode. Yeah. Don't forget, it is bands of light that we saw, but it doesn't have to be, um, well, it's visual. Yeah. So I suppose light's involved. But I mean, you could describe a, a zebra, if you're really crazy, as being striated, light and dark bands. Normally it's a regular pattern. Cathode. Negative electrode, anode, Marnie, what do you reckon it is? Positive what? Yep. And the last one was... Um, that's... Well, the terminal doesn't have to be an electrode, but an electrode has to be a terminal. You can have a terminal that means bus stage. Mm. Well, in, in, um, you can think about things like computing and whatnot. There are terminals in circuits in there which are not necessarily electrodes and so on. Electrode is a source of charge. Okay, and the momentum, correct symbol, not P, necessarily rho equals MV. And you could say it's a measure of inertia due to motion. Yep, same thing. Depends how many marks the question's worth. If there was one mark to find momentum and you did that, they'd pretty much have to give it to you. If there was a two mark question that says describe momentum, you'd probably have to do that. Okay, but as I said, define, yeah, tick for that. Okay, everyone happy with that? So, definitions don't have to be long and wordy, but they do have to be precise and describe what you're seeing. Okay, so that's just important there. All right, today's a follow-up lesson to yesterday. We did a lot of observation of stuff yesterday, and you should have seen properties of um, cathode rays in Geissler tubes, in Crookes tubes, and in gas discharge tubes. All variations of the same thing. Um, what's the difference, say, between a Crookes tube and a gas discharge tube? What was Crookes? The Crookes one was the one with the cross in it, the paddle wheel in it, and the uh, fluorescent screen in it. But there are also other types of Crookes tubes out there. So what's the difference between a straight gas discharge tube, say, and a Crookes tube? Not necessarily. No. No. 
What do you reckon, Jason? Different sort a discharge tube and a ga uh, Crook's tube. What? Well, they both had discharged them. Why do you think one set are called Crook's tubes? Crooks did them, yes. The scientist, I forget his first name, Woody Crooks, whatever his name was, he used them and he used them to do specific demonstrations and uh, specific experiments to do with cathode rays. Discharge tubes, they, they're just generally tubes where you have different um, volumes and types of gases in them and they have discharges in them. But the Crookes tubes are named because they're the ones specifically the Crookes used to do some experiments with them and put different objects in them. In the same way, the Geisler tubes, they're the ones with the, um, they have different shapes and gases in them and they demonstrate different things. And there's also those little ones I showed you with different types of ga gases in them. Do you remember the ones that glow different colours? Uh, Marnie liked the pretty bright reddy orange one, um, which I forget was, was in that. But they are called, um, they used to be called Plucker tubes after the German scientist Plucker who first did them, used them. So they're all just classes of the same thing. So today what we're going, you've seen them. But what were, what were they developed for originally? Scientific discovery. Scientific discovery. They're trying to make observations to learn something, not about electrons because they didn't have this name electron. They were doing it for the sake of trying to find out about electrical discharge. They're trying to understand what cathode rays are, what they're made of, how they work, and what they're like. Oh, right? No, Geisler was actually a serious scientist who was trying to understand something about the nature, about what this um, high voltage electric, electricity stuff was. They knew that electricity did stuff, but they didn't know what it was. Did they have high voltage like this one? No. This is before I just Yeah. Yep, well before me. Um, look, as far as they thought about atoms, they um, had Dalton's model of the atom, which is just basically a solid ball, right? And they understood it had different masses, they understood that different elements had different types of atoms, but they didn't know what was different about them. In fact, they didn't even know that there was a thing called an electron that was part of an atom. Now, today's lesson is the first one's largely going to be looking at some stuff and some note taking which defines for us what we learn or what the scientists learned from All right. now so we're going to go through some websites we're going to look at some additional um, just some historic pictures and things then we've got lots of notes to do and then next period, we're going to do some intro work, which is going to lead us into JJ Thompson's famous experiment. But as I said yesterday, the major problem with the famous experiment was he didn't only do one experiment. He actually did a multiple experiments, some similar, but he needed all three of them to reach his conclusion. So the syllabus is, um, actually says, describe JJ Thompson's experiment. But he didn't do one that was definitive, he did three. And um, as far as the uh, Board of Studies seems to be concerned, when they or outline, when it comes to doing um, a question, if it says describe JJ Thompson's experiment, you can pick it, any of them. Sorry. You make your choice. No, that's Crooks. Oh. We're going to come to JJ Thompson. Before we do JJ Thompson, we haven't looked at JJ Thompson yet. We're doing the development up. Then we're going to do some work today on electric fields and magnetic fields, and then that leads us into JJ Thompson. So just give me. I think I'm let's start it again. Ah! <laughs> okay, this is a summary of the stuff that we did yesterday. Before we look at that, I want to show you two things. The first one is in Inside Moodle, there's a number of resources around this stuff that you've just done. Okay? And you'll note that what we're supposed to do is we're supposed to explain the behaviour of cathode rays um, caused to debate about whether they are light or particles, and we're just getting on to that. But explain that cathode ray tubes allow the manipulation of extremely charged particles. We've well, seen that. We can make them go around in shapes, you can make different glows, you can do all that sort of stuff. 
identify that moving ch charged particles in the magnetic field experience a force. Well, that's I'm going to show you that. But also, I did. Remember, I brought the magnet near the Crookes tube, and you saw it bend. So we've done that. That's all fine. If you go to this this sheet, there are two links on it in Moodle, which you can go to. And the first one is a book. Um, a, is actually an e-book. And the ebook is a detailed explanation of the history of gas discharge tubes. Now, this is a free book if you want it, and you do not need to read it, it's just there. That there is one of the most famous pictures in the world. That's the first x ray ever taken of Ronton's um, wife's hand. That's her wedding ring. No, no. Now, the reason that's in here is because. Rogen, um discovered x-rays by accident and later on they found that x-rays were produced by gas discharge tubes as I said yesterday and it led to the development of medical physics which we may be doing later, yep. Hey, look. We found these really highly dangerous ways that can really cause you cancer. Let's take your hand there, let's take it Yeah, well, I didn't realise it's dangerous. Now, this is a picture... Here's a picture of um, one of the very, very early discharge tubes by looked at by another very, very famous scientist, Becquerel. Yep. Cathode ray tubes, yeah. What's, what's good about this? There's some pictures of some Geisler tubes. That one, I'll show you a better picture of that later and we'll talk about briefly. There's the plucker tubes, and you'll recognise those, that we use those. There's a very early um, induction core. And you see it goes in great detail about things. And you see that Crooks was not the only person who was involved in making these vacuum tubes and globes and trying to do things with them. And there's the famous Crook, classic Crooks tubes. <laughs> And there's x-ray tubes and things. So, that site there is actually available if you want to do some background reading and get a deeper appreciation of the history of this stuff. You don't have to do it. This site, the CRT site, is very useful. It's a good site. Cathode ray tube. Okay. So, in... Um, you have a little bit of background of a fellow called Wilhelm Röntgen. He's the fellow who discovered X-rays, and yes, and he uh, he actually kept a radioactive element inside. He's experimenting with, and he put it on some paper one day. He didn't realize um, photographic paper to keep it overnight. And when he unwrapped it, he found there was an exposure on the photographic film, and he realized that it must be giving something off and started experimenting. And he found that when he put his hand, when he put his wife's hand on the photographic paper and then put that near, it would take a photo of the bones, which is quite exciting at the time. And this leads to our understanding of X-rays. So, it takes a little bit of time. Now, that's a very early... See that tube there? That's a very early X-ray tube, and it looks very similar to the tubes we were using because of the... When the, the accelerated electrons hit it, and they actually just react with the glass, and that's what you get. And you might notice that further down, um, there are pictures of modern, where are we? That's actually a couple of X-ray tubes in action, giving off X-rays. And down here is a more modern X-ray tubes. That's not really what concerns us for this course. These are the, these are the guys the tubes. This has an ex um, explanation about who Geisler was and what he did, about how he developed a vacuum pump and then went on to look at um, gl glass tubes. It's nice because it shows some of the tubes that were developed and when they were developed. So you can see here um, a picture in 1870, and that's a picture of the actual, of one very, very similar, how it worked. And these are similar to the things we saw working. See the striations in that one? Different colours, 
different shapes. And again, these are not critical for the syllabus, but they're quite neat to see the sort of early work that was doing and showing how the charge could be made to flow around the different glass guides and so on. We have the musical one. And there are lots of different types. Well, that's, there's some large ones. Imagine you might green those from the front of the house because it's just like a continuous one of those. Now, these became, for the um, wealthy, these became a bit of a novelty item. So you can get different coloured ones like that. And you can see further down, if I can find it. Must be page three. Yeah, but for us, look, we live in a world where light is normal. And, you know, we switch on the light, we've got light and all this going on. Back when they first demonstrated these things, people would look at these things in absolute amazement and wonder what was going on. And they couldn't explain it so well. There's some pictures of early ones. They're the pretty ones. Can I find the comic one? That's what I'm looking for. There wasn't a music one somewhere with a, uh, a picture of a face and one of the bulbs and a bald-headed man and it used to glow different colours for his head. Okay, Crook's Tubes. Okay, I want to read this just quickly. It says, Crook's paved the way for many discoveries. He worked as a scientist in his own laboratory in London where he did all of his research and developed a range of different types of high vacuum tubes. On radiant matter, a lecture to the British Association for the Advancement of Science at Sheffield in 1879, Crookes demonstrated 19 different tubes and discussed the fourth state of matter, plasma. Many of his tubes stood as the basis of further discoveries like the X-ray tube and the Braun tube, which were developed later on. And um, the, nut, the Braun tube there is turned into a well-known TV tube. Um, there's more descriptions there about what he did, and also Hitorf was important in these things. There's the classic jars we used with the uh, Maltese cross. One of the most famous Crookes tubes, the tube demonstrates electrons go in straight lines and don't go through metals. It should say the metal is not transparent to them. When the cross lies down, the glass face of the tube meets the green glow when the electrons strike the glass wall. When it's up, you see shallow the cross. And they demonstrate that there. He also did work on minerals and fluorescent minerals and tried to understand them. And there's some fluorescent mineral work there. He's very interested in electrical discharge and in radiation. And Brad, just for you, there is actually a, um, a page there or, or a part on induction coils and about their development. And it talks about the just German um, Runkoff, who developed the um, induction core, and actually has a picture of the breaker and how they work. And interestingly, there's a coil there with a built-in Gosler tube on top of it. So there you go. <laughs> and you can find out more about those in other places. Okay. Now, first things. Gas discharge tubes were the early... We had Geisler tubes, we had the pl plucker tubes, we had the gas discharge tubes, and they showed us some things. You need to be able to describe these things. When you had that um, about three mils of mercury uh, as your pressure, you end up with a pattern similar to this. Right? It, this is just a, the, the standard get gas discharge tube where you've mostly evacuated it, you've got a cathode and anode, and you don't have any fancy stuff in between. It's just a straight tube. Right, because when they discovered um, how to make barometers, and I'll show you briefly. I'm going to have to get out of this. Okay. 
Okay. What they discovered, to answer your question, why Mercury? When they discovered barometers, what they discovered was that if you get a container and you put a pool of mercury in it, you've got air pressing down on it evenly all over it, right? But if you get if you get a tube, fill it with mercury and then place it into the mercury pile, it will run back down into the into the mercury dish, right? But it will only come down so far, so from there down will remain filled with mercury. Now, that part there, of course, must be, no, it can't be air, it's a vacuum. But down here, what you've got at the, um, it, with the mercury pool, you've got air pushing down on the mercury, and it's pushing equally, so it's pushing the mercury up into the tube, right, which determines the level. So when you've got high air pressure, it pushes down further and the column rises. When you've got low air pressure, that will go less pushing, so the mercury level on the outside will rise and will drop down the column. And what they did was they, they measure that height there, and I think it was around about 40 mils of height was about the standard height for mercury in, um, at, at sea level. And so they just call it air pressure after mercury's a millimeter, um, millimeters of mercury, I should say. So it's a historic thing. We've changed it now. We don't measure in that anymore. Measure in hectopascals. Yeah, we don't have mercury. Pascals. No, we don't use mercury anymore. We do. But, like, we still see rest of the We use, okay, well, thermometers are different, but um, we actually now use bulbs which change pressure and move devices around like that. Yeah, in what, fact, what we have. What about the, like, that? Thermometers, they use alcohol in them. Okay, so a couple of things just to note. You have an anode, you have an anode glow, that's that sort of um, that purplish glow on the anode, but it's actually not due to the cathode rays. Um, so, Sorry, I'm going backwards. You've got the cathode, I should say. You have Aston's dark space, and then you have the cathode glow. The cathode glow is actually due to something they used to call ca um, canal rays. No, I haven't mentioned those. Canal rays, remember I said that um, atoms had the electrons knocked off them and they become positively charged, and so they go that way? Right, so that causes the cathode glow. Then there's the cathode dark space. There's a bit of a glow, there's the Faraday dark space, and then you get that positive column which had the striations in it. The striations, as I said, were caused by the fact that the electrons are accelerated so they have enough energy to create light when they hit the particles. Then they lose some energy, so they slow down, they're accelerated again, so they have enough energy, they hit the particles more energetically, get more light, etc. So they get the striation, and then you get that. The electric field, because you have a positive, negative and a positive end of this thing, and we're going to show that. So this thing here is a picture of what you need to know for a cathode ray tube. You need to be able to name that stuff. And then there's a bit of a description about what happens for each of the tubes. So we'll come to that. That's what we we'll do at the end of this particular part. So your guys, your job quite simply now is quickly just take that down.